Hi and uh, welcome to this Visual Snow Initiative um, webcast. I'm sorry for the delay. I had to uh, refresh my browser and uh, and such things. My name is Peter Goadsby. I'm hoping that everyone can hear me because at the moment I'm just listening to myself. And Oh, we're live and we can hear me. Excellent. Thank you. So thanks for uh, listening, whoever's listening. Uh, it's a pleasure to, um, to get on and chat. As I said, my name is Peter Goatsby. I'm a neurologist. I, um, I got interested. I'm, I'm interested in visual snow. So I start, I'm a neurologist interested in, um, I started I'm interested in primary headache disorders, particularly interested in migraine cluster headache. And during my career, oh, and I must apologize for any of you who are listening to this, who don't understand my accent. It's a hybrid. Um, I grew up in, in Australia and I spent some, I've spent time in, uh, in the, um, in the U S and spent time in, a lot of time in the UK and a little bit of time in, in France. And I've traveled around quite a lot. So I've got a bit of a mixed accent. Uh, I'm sorry if, if anyone doesn't get that. Um, I'm seeing people write things on the top chat and I will, the way it's going to happen is I, I've got some submitted ones. I'll come back to in a second and we'll see what happens with the ones that are flicking up on the right hand side. I got interested in visual snow because I'm interested in uh, one of my interests is migraine. And patients would be sent along to me um, with the diagnosis of this sounds like unusual aura over quite a few years. And I found it rather frustrating because for the patients, because uh, it was clearly unusual. And so everyone was putting their hands up and it didn't sound like aura at all. Um, so I was invited in 2005 to speak to the North American Neuro-ophthalmology or Neuro-ophthalmology Society um, in um, Copper Mountain in Colorado, and they asked me to talk about aura. I thought, okay, that's fine. And I thought I'd put a slide in about this phenomenon, this persistent visual disturbance phenomenon, which I didn't think was aura, um, and I was interested in what they thought. And the whole slide then dominated the entire question time and the rest of the discussion because they were clearly well engaged by this and the, the North American ophthalmologists had clearly seen this um, and were very divided about what it was and what its physiology was. And um, the, the first person who'd written about it, Grant Liu, um, was in the audience, interesting to hear his story. There was an ophthalmologist in the audience, neuro ophthalmologist in the audience who had visual snow and reassured everyone listening that people with visual snow weren't crazy because he didn't consider himself crazy interesting interaction so uh, you could tell it was a bit of a hot touch topic and uh, I collected together some patients initially did some um, imaging to try and see if the brain was different put it down for a little while I was subsequently inspired by a child um, who drew me a picture of what they saw and I mean it, it's very straight for children are very are honest uh, and, and they don't make that sort of stuff up and they saw they saw exactly what uh, adults were seeing and, and everywhere I went people said the same things it tells you that it's a it's a unique and a real um, condition if I could put it that way I don't think anyone out there has got it it doesn't doubt that but it's quite a aha moment when you realize how how much of a singularity um, the, the biological process uh, must be, if I could uh, if I could say it that way. Um, so eventually, um, when Christoph Schenker was working with me in San Francisco, we decided to go and um, to, to try and formalise the diagnosis and provide criteria and sort of put it on a, a, a firm step to get things started. That's um, how I've uh, become in, involved in it. I'm sure the criteria are wrong, wrong at some level um, because all criteria, when you do them for diagnosis and research, they have to 
They have to be very reliable. They can miss a few people, but they can't, they shouldn't misdiagnose anyone with a problem that doesn't have it because then you, you muck up the entire thing that you're doing. So that's where things got started. And we've been uh, quite busy since. And I'm grateful for all the patients who, people with visual stuff, who've contributed and I've contributed on the research side and, and contribute to everything that I've been doing. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, I, the current research that we're doing, we're interested in what I call the phenotype, the appearance of the condition, how, what it's what, what it associates with, um, how medicines, we have large now more than 1,000 patient um, database that uh, Francesca Pellet has been working on. Many of you would have interacted with her um, to try and understand. At the start, I was hoping to understand what the theme would be for things that improve visual snow. But probably the most useful thing we're doing is working out what doesn't, what actually doesn't make it better, which actually um, makes it uh, in some ways worse or at least doesn't do any good. So we, we're interested in that therapeutically and then how the condition, um, how the condition um, runs with other, uh, with other symptoms, so to speak. So what I call phenotyping. We're interested in the physiology, um, particularly functional imaging. I think that um, understanding the brain region, regions of the brain that are involved and the way the brain's behaving when you see this snow in comparison to how someone else's brain behaves looking at, say, the same black screen, to, will tell us what areas of the brain we need to target and be thinking about in terms of um, the disorder and then in terms of developing uh, therapies. I wish we were closer to that, but our, the understanding of the condition is relatively young. It's not something we've been studying for uh, for long enough. I'm sure that's true. I'm the way the questions were done. I have a list of them, and I see things flicking up on the chats on the chat screen. So if my eyes are flicking around, I'm um, I'm looking at that. The way things were done were the questions were submitted to the uh, question and answer um, contest, and they were chosen by a random um, number generator, just for fairness, because there's probably more questions than we'll be able to uh, we'll be able to get to. And I'm going to start doing those questions for a little while and see where we see where we get, so to speak. I'll put that over there on that side of the screen and get to some questions. So let me start with Susan from Alaska who's asking what other diseases or syndromes or conditions can mimic visual snow symptoms that people should be tested for before blaming their symptoms on visual snow or joining the, the research, the weight, the, or the weight uh, for research to find the answers. Um, I'm always encouraging other people to rule out other causes and suggest that this would be, um, would be, would be helpful. I think the first thing about the um, condition in terms of getting, uh, if you want a, a list of things to be tested for, is to stop before you get tested and speak, find someone you can speak to who's interested in talking about the symptoms. Because the, in medicine, you start with the history and you get the history right and you understand the clinical presentation right. And then you should test people for the things that make sense for the presentation uh, that you have. So a blanket list of testing is just going to, it's, what it does is produce to a certain extent some, what you call false positives. So things will turn up um, that you wouldn't, that are irrelevant, so to speak. You just randomly go and do it. Let me give you an example. If you uh, take a brain scan on a hundred people, one or two will have some change on their brain. If you just went randomly out on the bus and collected a hundred people. And you do them no service telling them there's some change on their brain, which is irrelevant to the problem that they have and probably relevant for their entire lifetime, but it ends up making them um, sort of labelled with having some change on their brain or then worried about it afterwards. So I, I, the, the first thing about testing people is test them for what you think they might have, not just for everything you can think of, because 
anyone can provide you with a list of 50 things to do, that doesn't help as much as getting to as, as understanding the problem and how it manifests in an individual so you can make an appropriate investigation. That said, if you've got visual disturbance, it's easy, you don't have, it's easy to think that it's useful to have your eyes looked at um, from the outside. So the, the, the covering the cornea and then back on the inside to make sure that the actual visual apparatus are normal. But after that, you could, if you put the research knee down for a moment, there aren't a lot of tests you really need if you've got absolutely typical visual snow, the, the, the whole syndrome, that is to say, because we, 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 if you take visual snow and you have some of the other symptomatology like the trailing or the, um, or the after images or the little squiggly lines when you look at the blue, uh, at the um, blue sky, um, the light sensitivity, for example. If you know the picture of the syndrome, then the physician um, should be able to put most things, uh, most other things that would need testing uh, to one side. So I think the, I think probably the most important player in the non-neurology, not interested in visuals, not visual snow area is actually, is actually the eye doctors, the uh, ophthalmologists and neuro-ophthalmologists. And it, we need to engage them more. I mean, we, meaning the neurology community that's interested or researchers interested in this problem, so that they're the neuro-ophthalmologists, the ophthalmologists, the eye doctors become aware of it and can uh, facilitate the process of the of the clinical diagnosis, I think. So finding a, I, I'm going to, I was gonna say sympathetic, but it probably doesn't matter so long as they look at your eyes properly. Finding a um, neuro, a, an ophthalmologist or neuro-ophthalmologist to make sure that the visual apparatus themselves are normal is probably enough to, because visual snow really otherwise is, uh, is what it is. Ahmad from uh, Birmingham is asking me, how often are we finding an effective treatment and a cure? Uh, it's difficult, I know it's difficult to say cure when you, and it's, to, to find a cure, how many years roughly, but he's asking me, or they're asking me uh, roughly about how long it might take. I, to find a cure would mean needing to find the cause. I think we're a step back. I don't think I don't think we're at the cause. Um, I think we're understanding the we're understanding the brain regions that are involved, which tells you if you know the brain regions, you can work out from the literature what the chemistry, the 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 transmitters, the substances that are used in that part of the brain, and that starts to give you targets um, to begin to to begin to look at the problem systematizing um, the measurement of snow, systematizing the, uh, the, the imaging outcomes, for example, um, as a way of objectively measuring when, you, uh, when you're developing a treatment is where I think we're up to to get a treatment that's gonna be generally useful. Now, the upside, I will say, is that the syndrome is so stereotypic well, uh, everyone's an individual, but when you stand back from it, pretty much everyone has a has a core thing. Um, because it's a core thing across males and females, across um, different races, across ages, um, it says to me that there must be a common, um, there must be something very, a common area in the central nervous system. So once we get onto that, um, the, the the leap will be really <clears throat> the leap will be really quick because the um, syndrome because the syndrome is so similar in in everyone that has it and they like to need to give you a time I think I think adequately resourced um, and that's won't ask me how much that is but adequately resourced it'd be surprising if we couldn't get uh, a reasonable treatment in a at a relatively short number of years. Whether we get a cure or not is a, depends a lot. Depends on what we find out what the cause is. But treatment, I, I 
can't be beyond because it's such a um, homogenous, similar uh, thing and condition. So watch this space, you know. Erin from Colorado saying my 14 year old son was recently diagnosed and has had rapidly increasing non-visual symptoms of fog and depression. Are there treatments successful to help these symptoms without risk of causing visual symptoms to increase? It's a good question. There are comorbidities with visual snow, meaning there are conditions that happen more than chance or chance in the population. And the symptomato symptomatology brain fog is, a, is an excellent example of this is likely to be a manifestation of a comorbidity. So people with visual snow can win the lottery and people with visual snow can, um, can break their leg and they can get run over by a truck and they can get depression and they can get all sorts of things, not to be negative, but nothing's stopping them getting other, other problems. So I wouldn't describe, I wouldn't ascribe I wouldn't call visual snow a cause of brain fog. I wouldn't call it a cause of depression. Now, it can make the person depressed and unhappy, but it's a, certainly a, can be a very dis disabling problem. But see where I'm going with that? The biology, I don't think, is necessarily linked. So if I thought, if I, when I think about brain fog and I think about visual snow, it um, makes me think about um, the comorbidity with migraine, which is sort of where I walked into the, the problem. It's pretty clear that, more than average people with visual snow have migraine. I don't think it's because the two conditions are necessarily linked more than the biologies affect each other. So brains with migraine notice unusual things. And if you notice something unusual and you have something unusual, that is visual snow, you might expect migraine patients to recognize that more easily. That's where I'm going with that. Brain fog is something that happens in most of the phases, actually, the early in the uh, phases, particularly premonitory phase of, uh, of migraine. And I would think about when visual snow occurs with other symptoms, it illustrates that the most important thing is to get careful history of each of the symptomatologies, not just throw them all together and call them one thing, um, call it, say it's all visual snow and therefore there's nothing, nothing can be done, it's a bad mistake because not for some of the comorbidities um, like mood change or, um, or migraine are, um, are eminently treatable in fact, and, and will help in terms of being able to cope with the overall problem. So it's important not to mix, the, mix those diagnoses. Casey from Hawthorne's asking, um, many uh, sufferers will report that their visual static increases uh, when they, uh, when they exercise when they exercise um do you think uh, what do you think of this could a cerebral vascular disease be responsible i don't we don't know what causes visual snow but i will <clears throat> say to you i don't think it's a, i don't think it's a vascular insufficiency a cerebrovascular um limitation problem nothing we've seen on imaging suggests that brain function is is limited or turned down by any vessel input. Uh, input. Nothing we see on the imaging suggests um, re reductions in brain blood flow. So, and so I don't think, and one doesn't see people walk into visual snow with stroke. So I don't think that from a like a triggering a causal point of view. So I think probably it's not a cerebrovascular problem um, in terms of. Um, static with inc increasing with exercise. I've seen people uh, uh, report both increases and also re report distraction um, reduction with exercise. So I'm not sure that there's a there's one theme with that. Uh, exercise does affects people in a sort of in a physiological sense in a in a different way. So I don't, I wouldn't. I, th I don't think exercise is telling us more than um, if you change physiology, then the manifestation of the problem that you have changes. Don't think it tells us about the underlying problem. Uh, so the next one's Gavin from Glasgow, who's um, saying thank you, which is, thank you very much. I won't read the rest of it out. 
don't want to be embarrassing, but I, do you believe developments happening with CGRP, that's calcitonin gene-related peptides, a small peptide that's, uh, that's involved in migraine? So do you believe the developments happening with CGRP for migraine treatment could also help in visual snow? I'll stick my neck out and say I don't think so. Um, I think that the things that happen in the CGRP pathway are probably unrelated to visual snow physiology. So um, I think that it will, I think that, I don't think the CGRP treatments will be helpful for visual snow itself. Now certainly for people who where having migraine is making things worse, then the, um, then the addition of the CGRPs to improve the migraine is going to, will help them overall, help people overall. But I don't think that more, I don't think there'll be more of an effect on visual snow other than um, the effect on migraine. Well, of course, I'd be pleased if there was, but I don't think that we're going, I don't think we're going to see that. Lars from Olfen in Germany is asking, are we seeing neurons firing or what is static? Um, it's a multi-part question, so I'll start with what is static. Are we seeing neurons firing? That's a really good question. I think it is an activity problem, meaning an increased activity problem in a, in a filtering, in, perhaps in a filtered sense. Um, when you say C, that's a bit tricky as well. I mean, I, I guess I'm thinking that C means the conscious of, um, and are we conscious of a positive thing? Probably. And if that's true, then yeah, we're conscious of seeing, you're, you're conscious of seeing um, neurons firing in a way that you wouldn't normally be conscious of them, of you seeing them. So I, I think it's probably a useful way of thinking about that. Um, we see change increases in brain blood flow on the imaging side. We saw increases in deoxyglucose and metabolism measure of, that, uh, of um, the way the brain is uh, using its energy store, which both of which don't necessarily mean there's an increase because the way the brain works, you can see an increase in activity even if the new neurons are being more even if there are nerve cells trying to turn things off, if you like, that extend your energy during that. That said, I think it's more likely, given the phenomenology, that there is a, it is an activity problem rather than an inactivity problem. Second part of the question is um, about hyperactivity and filtering. And I, I think that's probably right. Um, you, uh, Lars is asking about the distinction between the two, which is more important. and think probably it's the way these regions are ordinarily filtered. Everything we do is filtered. I, I, I can't feel my shirt at the moment um, or unless I think about it because I filter all this input away. It's the way the brain works. We, the brain spends its time being interested in a small amount of things while everything else is going on around us. And it, I think it's likely that that visual filtering process is not operating in in a normal way that would make some sense to me in the way I think about these things. Um, next question uh, is uh, Casey from Texas. Can a person go uh, legally blind with, uh, with BS? I've heard both yes and no. Uh, I'd like to know the answer. I I was struck when I was at that um, North American neuro-ophthalmology meeting in 2005 when I think there were some, there were hundreds of people, neuro-ophthalmologists in the room and we started to talk about visual snow. It would be interesting um, for the thing, for, for the thing now, 13 years, maybe after a decade, uh, after a decade, I want to go back and, um, and chat with them again about what they thought. But one of the things I was struck by, um, and I asked them, and because I was interested, as I obviously got interested in the problem, um, not a single one in the room had ever seen uh, a patient with um, with visual snow uh, go blind. 
another one send me. There's probably someone will send me an email and tell me that they've had a problem and I'm wrong, which is fine. Um, and I'm sorry for sorry for that, but I think the chance of going blind with it must be really small because um, we've been interested in it for more than a decade now and I just haven't come across anyone yet um, who's where it's sent them blind. Now you ask about legally blind and that will be about function. Certainly your hair's function quite substantially. So the in the in the generality of things the answer to your question is no won't send you blind or look one I, I wouldn't pretend that I've seen every person in the world but I, I think that probably the answer to that's no next person Dominic from um, Czech, uh, from Czech Republic um, my uh, visual evoke potentials are abnormal. <coughs> what they are is recording the activity in the in the vision part of the brain at the back and flashing the light um, and and looking at the elect looking at the size of the electrical potential you can see with the uh, that you can measure during the skull through through the skull and the time to for the signal to come from the front uh, to the back. That's what a visual visual evoked potential um, is. So this, uh, Dominic saying that it's abnormal. Doctor told me it's due to be myelin disease. Could this be a cause of visual visual snow? Um, in the patients we've seen with uh, stra with uh, visual snow syndrome, the visual evoke potentials are normal. We don't think it's a part, and they, they, they test the visual pathway. We have no evidence at all the visual pathways, anatomically at least from eye back to visual cortex that there's any, any anatomical disturbance and when the doctor says that they're normal and you won't have demyelinating disease what they're probably probably thinking is that the signal is a bit slow getting back to the to the vision part of the brain the visual cortex that's not something you see in visuals no <clears throat> i don't <coughs> it's hard to ascribe it to that i wouldn't think that was right that's something you, um, that results something you do need to talk to the doctor about um, Ellie in Australia, um, who must be must be a bit late there. Thanks for asking. Uh, is saying are are our eye photoreceptors overstimulated when we experience a negative after image? When I produce a negative after image, it moves with the direction of my eye. If I blink fast, it becomes brighter. So after image is part of palinopsia. It's a core um, thing that occurs in visual snow, um, either the trailing or the, or, or the after images. It's probably part of uh, what we might call a disinhibitory process. So normally that image would be, um, would be inhibited to, for the brain to process the next uh, image. And it's, that clearly doesn't happen in visual snow. So I think that um, it's, Probably not the ocular, as in eye photoreceptors, that are responsible for that. I think it's more likely the brain representation of the signal, which is not inhibited properly, that that's what's causing it, rather than the eyes. There's the, every time, every time, and every way you look at the eyes in visual snow, what's called the anterior pathway. Um, you don't find any abnormalities at all, so it's difficult to think that it's a that it's a that it's a photoreceptor problem. It's it's uh, it's everything's not written, but all the studies so far have um, have suggested that it's not. And we certainly um, you know, we've certainly collected all the information we've collected. We've very carefully collected the data on. Um, evoke potentials, not seeing, not seeing that there's a, that they're abnormal, and certainly not seeing that photoreceptor problems uh, are abnormal. And I think it's been, collecting the research like that has been really important because it's, it's 
building on the strength of being able to answer these sorts of questions. And um, in, the, in the spirit of that, uh, I want to, on behalf of the campaign, and certainly for our research and um, all that's been the work that uh, Francesca is doing and the work that Christoph Shankin did and the work we're going to continue to do, I want to thank everyone who's been involved with it. Um, the, firstly, the Island Vision Foundation, um, now the Visual Snow Initiative, um, led by um, Sarah Dom, who've really allowed us to continue to tackle this problem in a way we wouldn't uh, otherwise otherwise be able to. The Snow Initiative wants to, let me do it personally as well, thank you for what you've given to the, um, to the CrowdRise uh, fundraising um, campaign. Uh, so far, $28,895 and matched by a private donor, so it's 53, nearly $54,000. Things have gone, gone quite well, so the um, site is going to keep the donation process uh, rolling in and try to uh, and try to grow that amount. Um, as someone asked earlier about a cure and about treatments, um, and that's what doing research is about and what the raising of money um, is about. So it's going to it's going to go on. Um, donations have happened from thirty five countries. It goes to show you how widespread the problem is. You all know that, and we virtually haven't had. Um, a question, I haven't repeated a single country in the questions that we've been doing. Because there's a, um, this is a, it's a broadly based problem, it goes to show you the total validity of the, of the biology. Um, the private donor has very generously agreed to continue to match. And so we'll um, match dollar for dollar um, everything that you give up to another $25,000 um, in, so in, in the next month. So if you are minded to take an interest in that, it's a good thing. All the money's going directly to um, the research. The, none of it's been leaked off or gone anywhere else. It's helping us, uh, helping some work in the US and helping um, my uh, colleagues in Melbourne um, in Australia, who, if they're online, hi. Um, you can go to the site's visualsnow.org, visualsnowinitiative.org, and um, happily click on donate. Um, thanks. I mean, it's great for um, the people who have been interested uh, enough to enough to do that. It's certainly enabled me to say some of the things I'm saying today, because otherwise I. We wouldn't be able to have the experience to uh, to to talk to talk about it. Let me go back to some questions. Um, someone's asking Rachel from Croydon um, in the uh, in the UK is saying uh, for someone like me who experienced visual snow syndrome for thirty the entire thirty years of my life, we do see uh, we we've got information from quite a lot quite a number of patients who've had. Um, had it for as long as they can remember. It's extraordinary when you think about it. Um, they're asking, do you think I might ever get the chance to see the world clearly? Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a show-stopping question when you think about it. I can see myself clearly, which is a surprising experience as you get older. And with my glasses on, I can see most things clearly. And I used to think I was pretty disabled by the fact that I'm short-sighted and take them off and couldn't see things. But it's a pretty um, show-stopping thought that you never see the world clearly. And most people take that for granted. Some of the most disabling things that happen to us are things that everyone takes for granted. Sight is one of them. So I think, will you ever see the world clearly? I certainly hope so. I, I'm not planning to stop at this. It's because 
it's just not right that people with visual snow have not had a fair shake at uh, getting better. Um, I certainly wouldn't like to think that a young person, young woman, was never going to see the world clearly, but it doesn't sit right. I see that um, one of the questions that's just come up on the live chat, and I'm watching a little bit um, that to, to see the themes. Someone's challenging me about why I think visual snow is treatable. I think it's treatable because it seems to me like a condition of the way the brain functions rather than a, a lesion. So when you think about brain problems, they divide themselves roughly into two types. There are things where there are lesions, stroke, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, um, Alzheimer's disease, where the brain substance um, rots away, if I could say it that way. So you can't, replacing it is really not on the, substantially on the agenda. That's, so you can ameliorate that. Let's treat them as the example for Parkinson's disease and people working on treatments for Alzheimer's disease. But the putting bits of the brain back is a, that's really a totally different challenge. Whereas visual studies, the brain itself structurally is normal, so they haven't lost anything in any substantial way, which makes it likely that the brain's not working properly. If you understood what wasn't working, then reversing that or augmenting something that's not working properly is a, see, it, from my perspective, is a plausible uh, physiological potential, which is why I think that it, it's not unreasonable to think that it's a, a treatable, that it is a treatable problem. Um, so I'm confident we can get somewhere if we just put our heads at it and um, put more more time and, and as much effort as possible into, in, into solving the problem. Um, someone's asked whether visual snow can um, develop after stopping or starting antidepressants. Um, of the medicines, the large group, and let me thank the people who were involved, if anyone's on the room that's involved, um, and the thousand people who responded to the um, to our web questionnaire, one of the things that's clearly emerging out of that is that if you disturb brain chemistry, you can't actually bring on or make the problem um, or make the problem worse. So it's true to say that it wouldn't be in that um, the on those medicines that do that, the antidepressants can be quite troublesome um, for some patients with uh, visual snow, making it worse in, indeed. And while there clearly there are people with comorbid that also have mood problems and need treatment for mood, the old fashioned tricyclic antidepressants, as they're called, uh, can be quite troublesome in, uh, in, visual, in visual snow. One of the comorbid things that turned up in people with visual snow is tinnitus and um, being asked about tinnitus, whether it's related to visual snow. Um, someone talk, one, of the, um, one of the calls was talking about uh, whether they could hear it in one ear or the uh, or, or hear it in one ear and not the other, and whether it's in both ears. So if you think about tinnitus, about three quarters of people we see um, with visual snow have got uh, also got tinnitus. I came to visual snow through the vision side of things because of my interest, because it came from the migraine sphere. I suspect if I'd been, say, an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and people had come that way, I might have come into this syndrome um, by um, actually by um, th through through tinnitus. If you think about it, stand back from it a little bit, tinnitus in the listening, the auditory system is probably an analogous process, very similar process to visual snow in the visual system. So I, I would venture to speculate that the tinnitus symptomatology that visual snow patients have, or if you're in the 
ENT clinic, at, uh, an ear, nose and throat clinic, might be the, um, the uh, visual symptoms that a tinnitus patient has from a CMATA perspective. I, would be, I wouldn't be surprised if the biology of that is very, very similar. They all, both of them say something about regulation and not, and the ability to filter out um, the noise, if you want, that happens, uh, that, that, that's, that's all around us. And it suggests a common mechanism. And I'd, I'd go so far as to say, gives me some strength that if we could get to, if we understood the mechanism of either, and this group of, of people, probably be able to do something about both of the problems because I think the physiology is at a level where these systems, uh, these um, brain systems, if you like, for vision or for sound are controlled. And if you think about it, vision, sound, they're very primitive senses of the, what we've developed. Humans are particularly perhaps a bit more visual than, uh, than other of our um, other, people, other species we exist with on the on the planet, so perhaps it's not surprising that visions become uh, is at the front of this discussion. If I can say it that way, but I think understanding either would will contribute to will contribute to both. Um, as it is, we're rather focused on the on on visual snow, but I think it would help. I think it will help all of the um, all of the symptoms. Um, so I'm being asked about uh, whether transcranial magnetic stimulation can help with visual snow. We've seen, we've seen we had an, our patients with visual snow use transcranial magnetic stimulation. I've certainly certainly can think of patients who say it's been helpful. I can think of patients who say it's been useless, and I can think of people who say that it's been okay. I don't think it's a panacea. Um, it, certainly not an all uh, curing panacea, which is a bit disappointing because the perhaps perhaps it tells you that the, the, the vision part of the brain is not the primary, where the primary problem is, but one of the parts of the brain that controls the vision part is what's doing, what's causing the problem. That said, um, Certainly, none of the patients used to come to any harm because it's a um, completely, completely safe, uh, safe thing to do. So we don't routine, we don't routinely use it, but I, I'm certainly not in any state, um, any state negative about it. Um, <coughs> getting a question, this is a structural question. Um, do you, it's, I it's a pretty detailed question. So the person's asking. I have a retrocerebellar arachnoid brain system. So that means the cerebellum is in the back of the brain here. It's the balance part of the brain, among other things. And what the cerebellum does is um, increases by the, our understanding of that increases by the year. But it's, among other things, involved in motor control, uh, my ability to move my hand around quickly, for example, and balance, um, keep, speech, uh, keep speech regular. And the person talking about it, a cyst, a uh, fluid collection around the cerebellum. Uh, it's contacting, and the back of the brain is where the vision part of the brain is called the visual cortex. And the question is asking whether the arachnoid cyst could be triggering the visual snow. I'll stick my neck right out and say, I think that's just about, that. that's not on the agenda. Um, we've seen a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people with visual snow and they don't have arachnoid cysts, or these arachnoid cysts in the generality of things, unless there's displacement, meaning parts of the brain are moved around or there's pressure, are not responsible for pathology at all, their uh, incidental findings. I'd be very surprised if an arachnoid cyst is causing visual snow. That would, and I wouldn't do an operation for, as, for visual snow as, an in, as the reason to do the operation. Um, on an arachnoid cyst, you want a very, very much, 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 much better reason to uh, do that. And that's true of, um, if you generalise that to any sort of brain procedure, there's no, um, there's no rational reason to be poking holes in people and drilling holes in their head or doing procedures on things in the brain in the hope that you're going to alter visual snow because there's no 
it's an irrational basis to think that the reason for doing it. There's a concept in uh, neurology um, called vomit, V-O-M-I-T, victim of medical imaging technology. The idea being if you get enough scans done and you find things, then people will get procedures done on something they find in their scan that's irrelevant to the problem that they went to the doctor for in the first place. And if you do some procedure, it'll cause problem. Having, knowing your brain is not, perhaps not like everybody else's in some subtle way is worrisome enough as it is. <clears throat> so the, a problem with something like visual snow is that we don't know all the answers. And so um, it, this is very unsatisfying, very often talking to the doctors about it. And, I don't know all the answers either. I'm sure I'm very unsatisfying to many people I speak to. That's that's no reason to do crazy things um, to, in the absence of uh, in the absence of uh, of knowledge. So um, it's very unlikely that anything one finds on a scan, if you've got typical visual snow, some this, if you did something to it, would change that. Um, that visual snow, that's not really a really the thing. Um, someone's asking me whether if I solve visual snow, uh, whether if, if you solve visual snow, you solve HPPD, that's and which would open up a Pandora's box for science. That's true in general, all research does that. Um, the research. Uh, in, because when you know something, you know actually what the be next best question is. If you understood how, what was going on with visual snow, you'd understand something fairly fundamental about the way the brain regulates vision. Um, that's bound to help people with visual, other visual disturbances, because understanding opens up, opens doors you never even knew existed. Why research is so important. Everything we do as we understand um, if we understand visual snow, uh, it will contribute to that. What's well, a good thing about research? At some level, it's good for person, people with a problem. But research is research is for like as a cultural thing for humans. It's just it's one of good knowledge is one of the things we can leave our children and feel um, quite proud, um, quite proud that we've done it. I think so. I'm very optimistic uh, about that. Um, I'm, I'm getting a number of questions about um, about medicines, um, range of treatments that have been being used. I'm not a nihilistic person. I didn't get into this because I want to be like I'm not a negative sort of person um, because I think this is a sol as I said before. I think this is a solvable problem. Um, that said. I, there's no reflex medicine for um, visual snow at the moment. Um, various medicines are touted as being uh, useful, like the anti fetal anticonvulsant drugs are very often useful. useful. Uh, I said to be very often useful. That's not our experience at all. Uh, I wish they were, but they're not. There is no real thing um, that you can just say, well, visual snow when you do that. I, I wish there was. That's that's really where the research is headed, to try and understand what the theme is, to know what the class of medicines are that we should be, um, that we should be aiming at. So I'm not a, 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 a really struggle to think of someone I've seen who's had substantial benefit from, really, really substantial benefit, I don't mean some transient benefit, but substantial benefit from the anti-fit or anti-convulsant um, medicines. Someone's asking me whether I think mast cell um, activation is a potential cause Brittany uh, for um, visual snow. There are mast cells in the dura, the covering of the brain, um, and they're around the uh, around the around the blood vessels um, in humans. I think it's unlikely that. Visual snow is a mast cell problem. Mast cells are rather diffuse. And when you look at brain activation in visual snow, 
it's rather restricted in the areas that are involved. There's a very definite pattern um, work we did with um, the work the work we did with um, with uh, Christoph Schenken on the on the um, uh, metabolic side would show you uh, came up with a limited uh, brain regions, and certainly the work that. Francesca Fred has been doing on brain imaging says the same thing. The mast cells are just a little bit too diffuse um, to be causing to be, to be causing that. I think some of the other questions I um, asked whether um, whether Lyme disease could be a cause of visual snow. I don't think so. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I think. Neuro Lyme disease we would be talking about. Um, if Lyme disease was a cause of visual snow, then the antibiotics would be standout way of treating it. But I can't think of ever running across a patient with visual snow because people are well done come to see me, but but haven't uh, haven't got a whole raft of input saying that treatment with antibiotics has been helpful for um, any sort of antibiotics, but and and those directed at uh, Lyme have been helpful for visual snow. The problem with that as an idea, um, and again, I'm not trying to be critical, but I'm not trying to be critical of the questioner, but to think about it in a, in a logical uh, logical way, is neuro Lyme is relatively diffuse in the areas of the brain it can, uh, can affect. It's difficult to think about how, even if you thought there was an infection there, and uh, overwhelming experiences that the um, patients where they've had lumbar punctures with visual snow don't have any um, signs of um, inflammation, but that it would pick off simply areas involved in that part of visual processing. That's just, um, there's no real good reason for that. So no, I think Lyme is not, um, is not on the, is not on the agenda as a, as a cause. Um, someone's asking when when would I think that clinical trials will start for visual snow? Soon as I have a target, I have to say. Um, our research at the moment is really focused on trying to understand what the potential targets are. Um, and when we have a target, we'll try and manipulate, uh, manipulate the target. I hope that's in the near term. I'm sure it will be in the near term because we're working quite hard at it and we've got some really quite good ideas. We certainly won't keep it a secret. Um, everything that we do that's um, good or bad, uh, we'll be making, posting and um, sharing with the Visual Snow Initiative. And in fact, if something important happened, um, like we wanted to start a trial, um, I think we would just do, uh, do a, a video like this and. Um, and tell people about it. I don't see any reason to keep keep it a secret. One of the good things about um, uh, this uh, this initiative is being able to reach a large number of um, people with the condition and just inform you about the things that are happening and let everyone know that there, there is a cohort of uh, investigators who are interested in the problem and take it seriously and want to understand it. Someone's just said to me, asked, um, how we can educate clinicians who are dismissive um, of, of the condition. As a physician, it makes me a bit sad um, sometimes the way people, the way colleagues treat people with visual snow. The way to deal with that is to well, not be sad for too long, pick up, uh, pick up the stick and to do it with data. So showing skeptical colleagues that there are changes in the brain, that this is something that's measurable and you can hold on to it uh, with biological measurements. And I, I mean, and I think imaging is, uh, brain imaging we believe is the way of doing that, really turns people's minds around. It's very, very difficult um, for someone to be, uh, to be dismissive of a fact it is what it is. Uh, med medical people are taught to think like that. So I think the way to get the um, get this 
we get respect for the problem is to get understanding. If you understand something, if you've got a biology behind it, then um, people understand it's a thing. It is what it is. It's an area, it's an area of the brain that's involved, and the um, the uh, if they can put that sort of organisation together, then they're much less um, inclined to just um, dismiss it away. They can say they don't understand it, which is fine. Um, you can't dismiss something if you can show uh, if you can show that it's there. I think that's um, that's that's certainly true. We've uh, we've come to the top of the hour, so um, life goes needs to go on. I'd uh, like to thank everyone involved in setting up the um, this uh, this this webcast. I think it's important to let you all know what's going on. It's important that you support what we're doing because um, it's a small group of people at the moment that are trying to pursue this problem, but we're a very enthusiastic group of people. We want to do good. It's not good enough, the current arrangements. It's not good enough that um, a diagnosis takes too long. It's not good enough that um, people don't handle this in a, in a professional way when they, when they hear about it. And it's not good enough that we don't have that we don't have decent treatments, but we're working on all of these things. And together, focus through this, this Visual Snow initiative, which is a way to get a global community to get behind the problem. We will make things, we will make things better. The more of you that get behind the problem, um, the easier that's going to be. Uh, I hope that this was useful to some people. No doubt someone will, and I'll, get a stream of emails about it. I'm sorry if I don't reply to, can't reply to every one of them, but every piece of information you give us is, is helpful. Um, let me thank uh, Sierra Dom and the Visual Snow Initiative and all the people behind it. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a great opportunity to speak to everyone. Stay well and um, let's aim for a day when that young woman who sent the question can see the world clearly. That's the way it should be. Thanks very much.